Good evening, church family. I want to give God the honor and thank him for giving me the opportunity to come to you with this small nugget this afternoon. Um, hope everybody's doing well. And so let's just get started. How about that? So today, um, God dropped something into my heart, and it was put your hand to the plow and don't look back. But before I start this message, I want to put some disclaimers up, and I got a few things that I want you to keep in mind as I go through these scriptures. So I want you to say it with me. I want you to say balance, balance. led by the Holy Spirit. Balance, led by the Holy Spirit. So I want you to turn with me to Luke 9, 57 through 62. These are the um, scriptures that we're going to um, go through this afternoon to get to that. Put your hand to the power and don't look back. Remember, say balance, led by the Holy Spirit. Okay. Here in this passage, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem with his disciples. Um, along the way, we have one of these disciples, followers of Christ, that actually asks Jesus a question. Jesus is take the opportunity at this time, and what we're going to see here, he is speaking to him about the high cost of discipleship. I don't think we ever think about the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. I know we always think about the benefits. We always know that, um, you know, it would keep us lifted up. It would keep us rooted and grounded when we're in his loving arms, what it does for us. But do we really think about the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ? Have you considered the cost before? I know we come to Christ for different reasons and in different ways. And as we learn and as we grow, we come to a type of revelation. But here, when these disciples are following Jesus, he points out some of the cost it is to be in the disciples of Jesus Christ. So let's start here at the beginning where he says, And it came to pass, as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee wherever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man no, have, has not where to lay his head. So if we look at this scripture and you really think about it as you begin to study the scripture and dissect, you come to realize that what Jesus is really saying to him is, have you considered the high cost, the cost of following me? The costs are, you're going to have to give up some pleasures. You're going to have to give up some luxuries. You're going to have to give up some of the finer things that you are used to. This scripture kind of, if you, you run reference on it, you'll see it go back to the rich one ruler when he said, hey, hi, what should I do now? And then the rich one ruler go away shaking his head like, when Christ told him to give up all that he had. Here again, he's just letting it be known, hey, this is the cost of following me. We must be fully convinced that the best way to live this life is doing God's will and purpose. Yes, this world entertains and gives us pleasures. We have most things on this earth concerns us, but, but there is a cost. There is a cost for following the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We don't think about it. We always think about our fire insurance. You know what I mean if you've been a Christian for a while. Um, what I'm going to get. Um, you know, I can go to him when I have a problem, but there's a cost. Let's see what else Jesus tells them. So as they're going along the way, that was the first. One. So the second one he looks at, and he, Jesus says in 59, and he said unto him, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Now, as we look at this scripture and do a little bit more in-depth study, we find out that this man father isn't dead at the time. He's talking about this father is either at home or of age or something. But what he's telling him, before I go fo follow you, I need to go back and take care of my family or my father. That's what we, that's what we found out. But this is what Jesus says to him. Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead, 
but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. So but the bed, the bed couldn't quite get that. But after I figured out what the scripture was talking about, it's talking about, hey, his father isn't dead. He's going back there to take care of his father and put Jesus on hold. And I'll come back and follow you later. But Jesus said, let the dead bury, bury the dead. So to me, Jesus here, wouldn't you agree, is saying priority is to preach the gospel. Could we not? I didn't say this. Not this is what Jesus is saying to him. He's letting him know priority is to preach the gospel. Remember, balance led by the Holy Spirit. Balance led by the Holy Spirit. And so let's look at 61. And another one said to another disciple, Lord, Jesus said, I will follow thee, but let me first go and bid farewell, which are at my house. So now we have another disciple that wants to go and back home, look back and go handle stuff at home instead of going with Jesus right now. Now, Jesus lived in um, a time in the agriculture world where we have to really the, the people that he was talking to understood what he was saying. Um, and, and what he was saying, it was very important here because when I read it up front, it didn't quite make sense to me. But let's look at what Jesus answered to him was. And Jesus said in him, no man having put his hand to the plow and look back is fit for the kingdom of God. Really? Okay. What is Jesus talking about? Now, this is another one of those parables where you got to look at what's going on in the natural to see what's going on in the spirit so you can get a full understanding of what this, what this thing is talking about. So let's talk about what does a plow have to do with anything? Well, if you think about the old days when they were plowing and they had the little oxen or they had the horse or the mule, it meant that with that plow, you know, you can't back up with that plow. That plow... It only tilts one way. And if you start looking back, then those that that auction or whatever somehow would get off track and start not making your grooves right. And therefore, you couldn't plant your seeds right, which would mess up your harvest and you wouldn't get a full harvest. So if you look at what's happening in the natural, in the agriculture days, you had to concentrate with and and put those harnesses on you right and go a certain direction with that plow. The same thing in the spiritual. When we are dealing with Father God, we have to do what we call walk worthy. We have to walk in the direction that God is telling us to go. And we can't continue to look at what happened yesterday and keep thinking about what we used to do and try to get back to those other things, we have got to be focused on what's going on right now in the moment. You know what I mean? Hey, I am not saying to you that we cannot remember and that we cannot gleam from what happened yesterday, but I can remember looking forward. I don't have to look back to remember. I don't have to look back to, to change a course of action or not to do the same things that I used to do. When we talk about this looking back, we're talking about dwelling. We're talking about going over and over and dwelling. And then we start doing this over and this over and this dwelling, what happens? We start getting into envy. We start getting into malice. We start getting into unforgiveness because that thing is twirling and twirling and twirling your spirit. Or we start regretting what we didn't do or what we should have did. Or I wish I could still do that, you know, but now that I'm saved, I can't. It puts us in a very, very... Um, particular situation. And if you look at the rest of that scripture, it said you are not fit for the kingdom. So if you got malice and envy and hurt or one leg on this side of the fence and the other leg on this side of the fence, because you're thinking about going back to what you used to do and, and what I wish I can do, you're not where you need to be concerning the things of God. Um, therefore, and you're not doing what the way God wants it done. You know, um, when we get into hurt and, and all these envy and things, this is how we feel. But when we are running around with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it's not about how you feel. It's about doing it the way he said do it. He will take care of all that other stuff. My question that I have to you 
Each one of these people had a but. But this, but that. Can I go this first? Can I? What's your but? Do you have a but? Is there something that Lord Savior Jesus Christ is telling you to go and do that he's talked to you or you got that personal relationship with him and you saying, I can do it later, but not now. Everybody don't have a but. Some, of, some people have a ride, but they used to have a but, and so, and, and, you know, but they don't anymore. But it's time for us now to always examine ourselves. That's why we read the scriptures. That's why we study the scriptures so that we can move forward with the things of God. So my question that I have to you, do you have a but? Life challenges are always trying to come in between us and the ministry. That's just a part of Satan's plan. This is why we have to maintain that personal relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because it will help us keep the balance in a world full of haggard and challenge, challenges and chaos. We need to have that place with Jesus Christ so we can hear him, so we can be led by the Holy Spirit to do the things that we need to do. There's a major cost in being a, a disciple of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that is we need to walk according to his words and we need to have actions according to Father God's word. Not the way we feel, not the way we think about it, not what... This is the way we think it should go. It's not every man in his own eyes. It's every man according to the gospel of the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, and what's in that word. That's a cost. Sometimes when you say, I just can't forget about what they did. That was just too much. Mm -mm. When you're in Christ and you got that relationship with him, he will help you. You seek out for the help that's needed so you can get past that, so that you can plow the right lines so that you can plow the right road and at the end you can get a full harvest of the things that father god wants you to harvest in this world so you can reach the people that you need to reach when you got all this envy and malice and all this stuff in your heart you 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 really you kind of unfit for the kingdom somebody needs your hand and the help but guess what you're not in a place where you can actually do that um i'm not saying don't remember I'm not saying don't glean from what's behind you. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying we have to watch how we do that. I'm going to give you a, a story and um, of a, just to try to explain one of the little things that Satan do, because, you know, he's still subtle. Some of the things that I'm talking about is not just as big as what we see in the scripture. Some of them are really subtle and we don't realize they're happening. I um, married my husband in 1984. Um, it was 18 years later. I distinctly remember 18 years because the conversation that I'm about to tell you happened between one of me and my friends, and she said, girl, that was 18 years ago. So here I am with one of my girlfriends in Okinawa, Japan, and we're having a conversation. And there was this young lady who I guess was after mama in, you know, before we got married, and um, she was using her little tactics to come and try to snatch down my Casanova. But Casanova, if you know what I mean, you know, didn't want to hear that I'm saying that's not right. You know, he said, oh, you know, she's just friends, you know, whatever her conversation was. So she did a few little underhanded things that just wasn't right. And um, so when my girlfriend was telling me, she was saying something positive about my husband. I would say, yeah, but girl, let me tell you about that Casanova. Now, look. The friends thought I said, you know, you have a great husband. I go, yeah, but girl, let me tell you about my Casanova. You know, what the man did 18 years ago. So I'm telling her what happened with this lady and what she did and how she got her backgammon game and was trying to use that for him to come over and drop it back off to her, et cetera, et cetera. I just got mad. And I was, and girl, let me tell you what. And then she did this right here. And then she did this right here. And she said, whoa, whoa, sister, let it go, let it go. That was 18 years ago. We're not going to break up a marriage for something that happened 18 years ago. So as I began to think about what happened, look, I've married a man. I'm 18 years down the road, and I'm just thinking about what happened. And I don't even realize that I am getting so upset that she said, whoa, whoa, sister, pipe down. 
out. And she started laughing. She said, it's okay. It's okay. Kind of fam a little bit. Um, that was 18 years ago. We're going to let this conversation go because we're not going to break up a marriage over something that happened 18 years ago. Can you believe that? That I got that upset. If that man would have walked through the door, it would have been an argument right then and there because I was hot. Too fit to be tied. 18 years later. How did I get there? How did I get so riled up and emotional about something that happened 18 years ago and we weren't having any problems? The point that I'm making is that when you start dwelling on stuff, these emotions and the feelings just kind of come on you and you don't realize it. So can you imagine when you're dwelling on other things and the wrong person walk up in, in your path or, or say something to you and you're holding on to what somebody else did, the hurt, the pain, the thought, really pain? I mean, we're 18 down the road. It really was no pain at this point. But look what my emotions had done. So the point that I'm making is we just can't dwell on the past and keep looking at the past, dwelling on it, digging in it, you know, coming up with ideas of how we're going to get back at people. The point is, Jesus said, let that stuff go. He said, think on these things. Think on whatever's good, whatever's lovely, whatever's of just reward. If there be any virtue in you. So the cost is, I have to do this Father God's way. Father God said, let it go. Father God said, pray for them. Father God said, I'll handle that. You see what I mean? That's the cost of being a disciple because we have to keep our channel clean so that we are ready to administer to other people. But when we go over stuff and go over stuff and sit there and get so mad and get so angry, what good are we for the kingdom of God? What good are we? I mean, it's written, he said it, but I'm just saying. So I say we need to put our hand to the plow. We need to start looking forward so that we can do the things. Philippians 4 and 8 is the scripture that I was talking about, finding my brother, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely. He's telling us the type of things that we're supposed to be thinking of. He said, Think on these things. Isaiah 4, 43 and 18. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the old things, because he's about to do something new. You know what I mean? But we mess up our new with our attitudes, handling things the way we want to handle them instead of the way Father God wants us to handle them. We have to make a choice. It's a cost to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's a cost. These are all costs that we don't think about, but that is a cost. I have to lay my feelings down. I have to do it the way Father God says do it. Trust him. Because when we don't do that, we lose hope. When you lose hope, what do you have? Um, you don't have anything when you lose hope. You know, we won't bear much fruit. We want to bear much fruit. The fruit of the spirit cannot work through you when you got all this other stuff. Or maybe two of the fruit of the spirit will be working in you, but then the other seven are not there. We want to bear much fruit. Much fruit. Because the more fruit we can bear. Have you ever met a person that was mad and just angry? You don't even know them. You just go in the store doing something. My God, what disposition is that? Have you ever done it? Or uh, somebody just always angry, or just always negative. That's that malice. That's that unforgiveness in their heart that you don't even want to be around it. So if people don't even want to be around that type of attitude, how are you going to be good for the kingdom? I'm just asking. Are we fit for the kingdom when we let our bodies get in that type of way? I say to you, looking back gives us regret. Looking ahead gives you opportunity. There is power in your future and encouragement for the present. Looking forward helps us to remain hopeful. Let us walk according to the word of God. Let us be good stewards of our mind, body, time, and talent for Christ. Without peace from your past, there is no power in your future. When, you value, when your values are clear, your decisions are easy. 
You are only as good as your values. Choose to value the Lord, Jesus Christ. Everybody have a wonderful afternoon, and I hope this um, blessed someone out there. It did bless me to learn and study it, so God bless you, and we'll see you next time.